Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Happy Memorial Day. Yeah. Is that appropriate to say it that way? Because yeah. <laughs> y'all know what Memorial Day is, right? Yeah. It's honoring those who died, mm -hmm. not those who are living, right? So I was out at the uh, cemetery yesterday out here. There's a lot of flags at that cemetery. There's a lot of veterans in this town. Woo, man, there's a lot of them. How many of y'all recognize that as being Arlington National Cemetery? How many have been there? Raise your hand. Yeah. So that's, you can't describe how humbling it is to go there. Watch, watch what goes on. So it's pretty cool. We were blessed to go there. But anyway, Memorial Weekend, right? Party time. And because it's Memorial, we're going to celebrate today. But I want to start off by asking you, young lady, what's going on with your husband? Because I'm giving you food today. And I'm not talking about just biblical food. I'm talking about real food. <laughs> All right, so let's go. Let's go to the Lord and pray, then we'll meet and greet Heavenly Father. Thank you for this beautiful day, uh, where there's a lot of smiles going on because of the news of Joe. We just thank you and praise you for that, Father. We just, uh, we, a lot of people have been praying for this man, and a lot of people just understand that it's going to go the way you say it's going to go. We're asking for peace for Joe and for strength for the family, and it sounds like, as always, Father, you delivered. So we give you all the praise and glory for what's going on in that situation. Heavenly Father, we also give you all the praise and glory for who you are and what you have done for all of us. We are just on our knees, bowing before you, Father, hopefully with humility, to come here and worship you today, to worship you and your Son, to sing your name, to say your name as loud as we can, Father. Please help us. Please help us in our worship because we want to be pleasing to you. And Father, I know this is a memorial weekend for us people here in America, and I just thank you for uh, all the service that these men have done and what they've given up to help keep us free. Father, I just pray for those families as well who's had to deal with the sense of loss because they did pay the ultimate sacrifice. There's no doubt about that. And Father, we just want to lift that whole, all those families up at this time. And then finally, Father, I just want to thank you for this congregation in this room here today. Yeah, it's always edifying and encouraging to me, Father, so I personally thank you that they are here to worship with me, to learn your ways, Father, because it's just, there's no other feeling like it is when you are with other believers in one accord to worship you. It's in your son's holy name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> All right, let's meet and greet. Yes. Uh, we're, we can't pray for uh, Joe but we also need to put his sweet little wife in our prayer. Oh, yeah. We can see this. We can see the stress on her face, even though she always has it. <laughs> Where's that face of that? <laughs> also, I forgot to, uh, in the praise, today would have been my mommy's oh. birthday. Oh. Mama Jean's birthday was yeah. today. So. All right, we'll pray for Janie too. It's <laughs> well, so we got a prayer. Let me get it started here, all right? Thank you for that. Let me, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, on my knees before you, asking for help today, as always. Asking uh, for you to just attack my heart and open it up. Attack my mouth, Father, that the words I speak are your truth and your truth only. And Father, please help us all with our ears to just open them up. Listen to what you have to say for us. When we walk out of here today, we are taking your word with us. We're applying it to our life. So we're living the way you want us to live, Father. Please, we need all the help we can get with that. And hopefully today's message will honor you as well as give us instruction on what you want. It's in your son's holy name I pray. Amen. Uh-oh, guess what day it is? Two. And two. And guess what day it is? It's Shavuot. It's the festival of weeks. 
otherwise known as Pentecost. Now, just like the Passover Seder that we just had a few weeks ago, today is a time of worship. It's a party time day today. Big time. But one thing that's different about today's party than it was for that festival that we celebrated at Passover is at Passover we couldn't eat leavened bread, right? It was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. <coughs> this feast, there's no restrictions. Eat what you want. It's Shavuot. It's Pentecost. God has said, eat whatever it is you want that I say is okay to eat. Now, a couple of traditional foods that you'll find on Shavuot is leavened bread. Not unleavened, but leavened bread. We all know what that is. Hopefully, well, if not, we'll explain it here. And guess what else you get to eat today? Cheesecake. Cheesecake. Who doesn't like cheesecake? Yeah, cheesecake. Before you leave today, I'm going to have a dish of cheesecake in front of me with spoons, and you better grab a spoonful of cheesecake so you can remember what today's all about, friends. Because today is all about celebrating our God. Amen. Now, why are we celebrating Shavuot? Why are we celebrating Pentecost? What's the big deal, guys? Well, here's the big deal, friends. Today, we celebrate our God completing his redemptive plan. Amen. Today we celebrate God keeping his promise to mankind. Today we celebrate God's promise being realized. The festival of weeks is a celebration about completion. That's why leavened bread is highlighted. What is leavened bread? Flour, water, yeast, let it set, let it mature, and when it's done maturing and it's complete, you bake it and you eat it. That's why leavened bread is celebrated today. So we're going to spend some time this morning getting to know this very special day for believers. Now as a believer, understanding this day, it is a must, it is a must, it is a must, and you wish to be closer to your Father. Now when you think of Pentecost... What is it that you exactly think about? Most believers will tell you something like this. They'll say it's a day of the Holy Spirit. They say it's a day where God did something spectacular. You also might hear believers say something about speaking in tongues. Right? You also might hear believers talking about rushing wind and fire. All of this is how it relates to Pentecost Day. But what you might not hear from believers, what you might not hear from them is they talk about this day from his perspective, not from our perspective. You might not hear a believer talk about how this day is connected to Passover. And for sure, guys, this day is connected to Passover. What you might not hear, brothers and sisters, that this day is completion day of God's promise. Now, our church just celebrated Passover a few weeks ago, right? Passover Seder. How many of y'all were edified by that? Me. I raised my hand too, right? How many of you all walked away from that whole experience feeling just a little bit closer to God and Jesus? Yeah. I did. Yeah, I'm with you guys there, all right? I know for sure that was edifying. Passover and Jesus, they just go hand in hand, right? It is at that Passover that our Savior ate His last meal, right? It is a God-decreed festival, Passover. It's a celebration meal. Jesus made at this meal his starting announcement. You remember what that startling announcement was? I'm leaving you. I'm going away. He told those disciples, don't worry, I'm coming back. They didn't even understand him at the time when he was talking. They had no clue what he was talking about. They eventually did come to understand what Jesus was talking about when he said, I'm not going to drink wine with you again until the kingdom of God arrives. But they didn't understand it there at the Passover meal. Now we believers, all of us in this room that are believers, we, don't we hold it in our hearts very dear, very near to our hearts, that very soon, very soon, very soon our Messiah is coming back to claim His throne? We, I hold on to that. I don't know about you guys, but I hold on to that. Now after Jesus died and He resurrected, we know that Jesus didn't immediately ascend to heaven, right? There was a period of how many days? Where he walked around doing things. Four zero. There was a period of 40 days where he visited people. Many people. Including the disciples. 
During this time, he was showing himself to people. He was speaking to them. He had some serious business that he needed to take care of before ascending to God. He had teachings to teach. He had instructions to instruct. He had God's business to take care of. What a time that 40-day period must have been. Think about it. How would you have liked to have been living during that 40 days, talking to Jesus face-to-face -face right after he was murdered and he rose from the grave? Knowing what I know, I'd love to have done it. I don't know how I would have done it. I mean, Jerry kind of talked about talking with God face to face. And I'm like, that's hard to imagine. It's just hard to, for me to imagine here. Now, during this time frame, when Jesus was appearing before people after he arose, we learn of a specific incident where he gave specific instructions to some specific people. And what he told them was, wait in Jerusalem for something to happen. So let's check out what Jesus says when we read in Acts Chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, this. The first account I composed, Theophilus, all about that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up into heaven after he had given orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of things regarding the kingdom of God. Gathering everybody together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Which, he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So do you see what's going on here, guys? Jesus is, after he was killed and he arose, he's walking around, talking, instructing, Teaching, and he's telling these people, something's coming. You need to wait. Something's coming. So 40 days after Jesus arose, he ascended into heaven. But before he ascended, Jesus gave these very clear instructions to the disciples. Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem. Don't wait anywhere else but Jerusalem. And wait for the promise of God. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that sounds very intriguing. I have questions about this when I read it. What's going on here? Do you think that way or is it just me? Do you have questions about what's going on here? For instance, here's one question that I have. Why is Jesus instructing his disciples to wait in Jerusalem? Why can't whatever was going to happen happen somewhere else? Why couldn't it happen in Bethlehem or Corinth or in Chanute? Why couldn't that happen? Why couldn't the promise of God come to Chanute? how I think I'm sorry there is a specific reason Jesus said wait in Jerusalem that's what we're going to talk about today and not only is this location thing very intriguing to me at least here's something else that's intriguing what exactly is the promise of God that Jesus Christ is speaking about what is the promise of God and furthermore what about this being baptized with the Holy Spirit thing what does that mean? The way this is worded, I don't know about you guys, but the way this is worded, a person can reasonably deduce that the promise of God and the baptism of the Holy Spirit are two different things, but a reasonable person can also deduce that they are not two different things. It's the same thing. They are connected. There's no doubt, right? They are connected. But which is it, guys? Is this two different things going on? Or is this one thing with two different names? Can you answer that? This is the kind of stuff I think about, so bear with me, alright guys? <laughs> this day that Jesus says is coming, that we read about, this day that Jesus Christ is talking about is Shabbat. It's Pentecost. This day Jesus is talking about that's coming is the festival of weeks. And today, we purposely celebrate this very magnificent day. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, this is a big deal day. Let me say that again. This is a big deal day. This is a day that has many significant meanings that if you are fully aware of all the blessings, you're going to walk away just a little bit closer to God, just like you did after the Passover Seder. Now, Pentecost means 50, 5, 0. 
Pentecost doesn't mean Holy Spirit. Pentecost doesn't mean a certain denomination in Christendom. Pentecost doesn't mean baptism. Pentecost means 50. The reason Christians call this day Pentecost is because whatever happened on this day, it happened on the 50th day. The reason the Hebrews call this Shavuot, or the Festival of Weeks, is because God mandated this celebration using a certain time frame. He commanded for this festival to be counted. To be counted seven weeks plus one day from a certain event that's already happened. Seven weeks and one day after that event, you're going to have another celebration, says God. And you're going to do it to honor Him. Now, seven weeks is how many days? 49, 49 days. Plus one equals what? So we have 50 days, right? So what do we count 50 days from? Where do we start counting at? 50 days after Jesus ate His last meal? Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? 50 days after He resurrected? Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? 50 days after He ascended to God? Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? When? And not only when, not only do we need to understand this beginning count point, but I also want you to think about this. Why 50? Why can't it be 10, 40, 73, 190? Why does it have to be 50? The reason why it has to be 50, guys, is because this is connected to Passover. Back when Moses was alive, he was leading those Israelites out of the bondage that they were in under Pharaoh. You know what I'm talking about, right? We learn that this was the very first Passover event, correct? That was the very first Passover. After God sent the plague of death, the Israelites did what? They vamoosed. They skedaddled out of Egypt, didn't they? And where did they start heading to? The promised land. During that journey to the promised land, there was an incident. There was an incident where Moses had to meet with God. Where did Moses meet with God at? Anybody know? They met at a specific location. Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. That's where they met. Everybody's heard of Mount Sinai, haven't they? While meeting with God on Mount Sinai, God gave Moses something that was meant for every one of his chosen people. What did God give Moses? He gave him the Torah. We've talked about that. You Wednesday night people understand what the Torah is, right? The Torah is the first five books of the Scripture. That's where Moses got the Torah. It is God's teaching on how to live a righteous life. How to lead a life that pleases Him. Now, Exodus 19.1 explains that Moses arrived at Mount Sinai in the third month after leaving Egypt. Let's read that real quickly here. Verse 19. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. Are you following me here? Moses got to Mount Sinai on a certain day, didn't he? In a certain month. We know that the Exodus started the day after Passover, right? The day after Passover, which was the 15th of the month. So Moses arriving at Mount Sinai around the first day of month three after Passover means he would have been at Mount Sinai somewhere around day 48. Think, we can go through the calendar later, but just trust me if you do the math, it's there. Uh, scripture doesn't tell us exactly when he got there, guys. It doesn't say he exactly got or arrived at Mount Sinai on this date. But it was most definitely, friends, around the 50-day mark. Now, most Jewish and non-Jewish theologians, all these titans that know are way smarter than I'll ever be, all of them agree it is highly likely that Moses received the Ten Commandments on the 50th day of the Exodus. When you sit down and you write out the calendar events on a pad, on a legal pad, and read the Bible, and you write down the calendar events as described in the Bible, even though it doesn't say the Ten Commandments were given on the 50th day, what you come up with is very little doubt. The timeline is just too exact 
to ignore the 50th day. To this day, to this day, guys, all Hebrews celebrate Shavuot, the festival of weeks, as the celebration when Moses received the Torah, the Ten Commandments, the law. So this event, the giving of the Torah to Moses on the 50th day, after the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, this set the stage for a new festival called the Festival of Weeks. Shavuot, Pentecost. So on the very first Shavuot, Pentecost, there on Mount Sinai, God reinforced something. He reinforced the covenant that He made with Abraham. He reinforced that covenant by giving Moses the Torah. That's why he did it, which included those commandments that Hunter just mentioned. I think it was Hunter. I thought I heard. So, so right after this event, guys, right after this event, God mandated a festival. And we're supposed to celebrate it every year. And he mandated it that it be celebrated only at Jerusalem. They call that the Feast of Weeks. The festival is part, or this festival is supposed to start seven weeks plus one day after the Sabbath of Passover. Seven weeks plus one day, 50. That's why it's called Pentecost. This annual festival of week celebration, this feast of weeks is the reason Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. They weren't, couldn't go anywhere else because this festival has to be held in Jerusalem. If you want to follow God's direction. Many Jews at that time made pilgrimages to Jerusalem just for this feast. Jesus knew. He knew because he followed the Torah. Exactly what was coming up. He knew something special was going to happen on that specific day. On that specific day of Shavuot. On that Pentecost. On that 50th day. And that's why this couldn't take place in Shanut or anywhere else. Because this festival, just like Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it requires a pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. Can't be going on anywhere else back then. And this particular Pentecost, are you with me? This particular Pentecost, right after Jesus ascended to God, this Pentecost was to be the Pentecost of all Pentecost. Do you understand what I'm saying here? This Pentecost... God was going to fulfill His promise. God was going to fulfill His promise that He started with Jesus being born, with Jesus' ministry, with His murder, where He took on the wrath of God, with His resurrection, which was the, God's approval for what His Son did, for the ascension of His Son to His right hand. This Pentecost, this Pentecost is what we celebrate today, guys. It's a big deal day. So what is this promise of God that Jesus speaks of in Acts 1? We just read it, right? What is this promise of God that Jesus is talking about? Well, this promise of God is related to the purposes and to the will of our Father. I want to take you back to Exodus again, to chapter 20, verse 18, where Moses had just finished giving the Ten Commandments to the people. So you're there, right? Moses... You're watching the Ten Commandments movie and you see him doing his Ten Commandment thing and he's talking to the people. After the last commandment, after that very last commandment, let's check out what we read. What we read in Exodus 20, 17 through 18 this. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. Now all the people witnessed something. So while Moses is just finishing up the Ten Commandments, they're looking and seeing something. What are they seeing? Thunderings, lightning flashes. They're hearing the sound of trumpet. The mountain is smoking. So who knows what's going on right there? The people saw it, and what happened? They trembled, didn't they? So there's no doubt Moses giving the Ten Commandments to those, something visual was happening. No doubt about it. Now, there was an understanding back then with those disciples of Jesus, those, you know, Peter, Luke, all those guys. There was an understanding, in fact, by all Jews that their forefathers, those Hebrews who were on the mountain with Moses, those people actually saw with their eyes 
the giving of the commandments to Moses by God. What they witnessed was the giving of the Torah by God to Moses, and it came with thunder, and it came with lightning, and it came with the sound of trumpets. It came with fire. Jews could look back then and to this day believe you can see the voice of God by what's talked about here in Scripture. Makes sense, right? They believe that. In fact, you read that throughout Scripture. Let's go to Psalm 29.7 where we read this. The voice of the Lord, the voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. This is speaking to how Hebrews believe you can see God speak. So when the Holy Spirit came on Pentecost, right after Jesus ascended, the Spirit came in the same way as Moses received the commandments on Mount Sinai. Now I want you to think about that. Think about that and ask yourself this question. Did the Holy Spirit come on Pentecost in the same way as the commandments came to Moses on Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai. Well, let's see if we can find the answer. When we read in Acts 2, verses 1 through 3, this. The festival of Shabbat arrived. Oh, no shocker there, right? And the believers all gathered together in one place. Well, we know where that's at. No shocker there. Suddenly, there came a sound from the sky like the roar, roar of a violent wind. And it filled the whole house, right, where they were sitting. And they saw what looked like tongues of fire, which separated and came to rest on each one of them. They were all filled with the Rock Kadesh, the Holy Spirit. And they began to talk in different languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. So when we see the coming of the Holy Spirit, was accompanying with what? What accompanied the Holy Spirit? Loud noises, rushing mighty wind, flames and fire, and many human languages. Then we can see that those people of that day back then, those Jews that had pilgrims to the Festival of Weeks, just right after Jesus ascended, we can see, friends, there is a similarity between God sending the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai and God sending the Holy Spirit on Pentecost Day. For sure, the Jews of that time believed the Holy Spirit coming to man was essentially a replay of Mount Sinai event that happened 1,300 years ago. So to the Jewish believers who experienced what was happening that day, the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, on Shavuot, was the second coming of the Torah, the commandments. Why did they think this, guys? Have you heard this before? Why in the world would they think Pentecost is about the second coming of the Torah? Do you think that when you think of Pentecost? Most people don't. The reason the Jews believed the coming of the Holy Spirit was on Pentecost was essentially the same thing as God sending His Torah again is because of this promise of God that Jesus Christ spoke of. They believed because Jesus Christ told them this was going to happen. The difference between the first coming and the second coming of the Torah, that was spoken about in the Scripture by the prophet Jeremiah. He prophesied this promise of God that's coming on Pentecost. The promise of God that our Savior Jesus Christ said, you wait for it. This is what you read in Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, says God, when I will make a new covenant. Who's that? We all know, right? With the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers, meaning Abraham, in the day that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says God. I will put my what? I will put my law, I will put my Torah right here in their minds, and I'm going to write it right here in their hearts. I'm going to be their God. They are going to be my people. This is the promise of God Jesus Christ is talking about. The first coming of the Torah was at that very first Pentecost on Mount Sinai. 
And God's word was written on stone tablets, wasn't it? To the Jews, the second coming of the Torah was at Jerusalem on Pentecost, right after Jesus ascended to God. But this time, guys, the Torah was written on the heart. It was written in the mind, just as Jeremiah prophesied. This is the promise Jesus says is coming. Do you understand what God is saying here? The promise of God, according to God, is that He is going to make a new covenant with His people. We just read about that with His house of Israel. He's doing this because Israel broke the first covenant. And in this new covenant, God said He's going to send the Torah again, but this time, not on stone. It's going to put it in your mind and put it in your heart. Now, how is this, how is this promise supposed to be delivered to you guys? To us, I should say you guys, but to all of us, right? How is it supposed to be delivered? The prophet Ezekiel talks about how it's going to be delivered to us on this second time. Read what he says in chapter 36. I will give you a what? A new heart. I will put something new inside of you. A spirit. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And then what does he say? I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. On Pentecost Sunday, on Shavuot, God delivered His promise by sending His Holy Spirit and He put that Holy Spirit into the hearts of the righteous Jews of that day on Pentecost. Now I want you to fast forward to today. Right now. Just like He did on that very special Pentecost day, Jesus Christ will put the Holy Spirit in your heart if you choose to follow Him. And when He puts the Holy Spirit in you, when He does that, it will cause you to do the same thing the Jews did back then on that special Pentecost. That Spirit will give you power. Power to walk as He says you're supposed to walk. Power to worship God the way He says you're supposed to worship Him. The promise given that day by God to the Jews, that power to walk in His ways, it also gave them power to do something else. You know what it is? This is what He gives you power to do. To proclaim loudly and boldly the good news of Jesus the Christ. That's what the Holy Spirit does for you. And when the Holy Spirit invades you, Mr. and Mrs. Gentile, when that happens, it's going to cause you to have power. The same power it caused those Jews to have. Why? Because you will have God inside of you. That's what's going on on Pentecost. The promise given that day by God gave the Jews the power to walk in His ways, just like I said, to proclaim loudly the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do not let go of that, folks, because that's what's going to happen to you if you accept the Christ. This is what happened on that special Shabbat Pentecost day. I praise God that He sent His problems. Do you? I praise God because it's miraculous, it's wonderful, it'll change your life, and it's yours if you want it. If you want to claim it. But wait just a minute, guys. Is this new covenant really yours if you want it? You're all shaking your head up and down like, yeah, I want this. Well, can you get it? Is it even yours? Well, let's see what God says. Take note of Jeremiah 31, 31. I want you to notice what it says here. Does it say He's going to give the new covenant to the Gentiles? No, it doesn't, does it? Does it say He's going to give the new covenant to anyone and everyone? Nope. It doesn't say it. The Lord is giving the new covenant, this new covenant that Jesus is talking about, to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah only. That's it. You don't see Gentile written there anywhere, do you? And Gentiles are certainly not part of Judah or uh, the house of Judah or Israel, are they? So does this mean, guys, that only God's chosen people can partake of the new covenant? Does this have what it means? It's exactly what it means. 
That's exactly what it means. Do you remember what we talked about in Bible study this week? You can't add words to this, and you can't take away. God said it's for Israel and Judah only. That's exactly what it means. You have to be a part of God's chosen people to receive this promise. Oh no, I'm panicking now. Because I'm not chosen. I'm not a Jew. This promise that your Savior is talking about, Jesus Christ, the promise that came on Pentecost that Jesus said is coming, is not for Gentiles. That's what your Savior says. And don't argue with me. You argue with God about it. He's the one who wrote it. Now we have spent months and months in the book of Ephesians, haven't we? Where we have learned Paul teaching us Gentiles that we people who were once far away from God, haven't we learned that we are now in the family of God? We are now united with the chosen people. How are we united with the chosen people that God's talking about with the promise? By the blood of our Messiah. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen? That's how we're united. The festival of weeks. Shavuot. Pentecost. It is a celebration that God fulfilled His promise by sending us a new covenant. A new covenant that Jesus Christ says He ratified by His blood. A new covenant for anyone who accepts Jesus Christ, Yeshua, as the Son of Man who came from heaven, wrapped Himself in flesh so that we can be reconciled to God. And God also sent His Spirit to us on Pentecost as a promise, as a promise fulfilled that we believers, both Jew and Gentile, can now worship God together in one accord. You've read that throughout the whole Scripture. We are now in one accord. Because of Jesus Christ, we all can be reconciled together, both Jew and Gentile, into one new person. We've been talking about this for months. What's the new person called, guys? Anybody remember? The body of Christ. That's what we're talking about here. That's why Pentecost is so special. And the Holy Spirit, guys, please understand this. The Holy Spirit is God's seal on you, on me as a believer, that we belong to Him. That's what the Holy Spirit is. We read this in Ephesians chapter 1, this. In Him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, guess what happens? You are now sealed in Him. And how are you sealed, guys? With the Holy Spirit. It's your guarantee. It's your seal that you belong to God. If you are a believer in Yeshua and Jesus Christ, if you have given your life to the Christ, then please pay attention to what I'm going to say next. And if you don't belong to Jesus Christ, please pay attention to what I'm going to say next. When you leave here today thinking about Pentecost, what this promise of God fulfilled means to you, I'd like you to keep this in the back of your mind. There is a day coming when Jesus Christ returns back to earth to claim His inheritance. There is a day coming when us believers and only us believers will be bodily resurrected and we will be reunited with our spirit and we will be wed to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. There is a day coming when our Savior is going to punish those. He's going to kill them for those who don't believe in Him. There is a day coming, friends, when we will not even need the Holy Spirit any longer to worship God. We will not need the Holy Spirit to walk in His ways because we will be in the presence of God Almighty serving Him just like He created us to do in the beginning in perfection. No darkness. No evil. The day is coming, friends. Pentecost. It's the realization that God does exactly what He says He's going to do. It's the realization that God will allow you and me to be in His presence if we accept His Son. It's the realization, friends, that you are sealed and guaranteed by the blood of Christ. And what you also need to know about this Holy Spirit thing, guys, is simply this. Before Jesus, 
God would send the Holy Spirit into people like He did on Pentecost. He already, this wasn't new. He would send His Holy Spirit into people, but it wasn't the permanent thing. Have you ever heard of Samson? Well, let me read to you what happened to Samson. So the woman, we read in Judges chapter 13 this, So the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson, and the child grew up and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir with him when he was in something, something I can't pronounce, <laughs> all right, between Zorah and Eshtal. So obviously Samson got the Spirit of God, right? But just check out what happens in chapter 16. She said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out at other times and shake myself free. But he didn't know that something happened. What happened? The Lord left him. So the Holy Spirit before Jesus Christ would infiltrate people for a purpose, accomplish His purpose, and then the Holy Spirit would leave. That was before the day of Pentecost. Before God sent His Spirit to Jerusalem that day. Because today, after Jesus took the wrath of God, after He resurrected, there's something different going on with the Holy Spirit. Through redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit promises, promises, promises to dwell inside of you forever. Never going to leave us. Never going to go away. It's never going to depart us. Having the Holy Spirit now allows us to experience God, to know God, to enjoy all the benefits of redemption. Which is what? What are the benefits of redemption, guys? They call that the fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit works in our life every day to edify us, to build us up, to help us live His way because we belong to His Son, Yeshua. Praise God. Praise God that He says, or that He does what He says He's going to do. That's You take that home with you. When God says He's doing it, He's going to do it. And He did it with Pentecost. This new covenant allows us to worship Him the way He wants us to worship Him, not the way we think we need to be worshiping Him. Because we get it wrong. You see that with all the denominations, don't you? We get it wrong. But the Holy Spirit will get it right. God made His promise on Shavuot, on Pentecost, on the Feast of Weeks, for all of us to take home with us every waking moment. Amen? As you leave here today, I want you to, I want to be holding a pan of cheesecake with spoons in it. I want you to grab a chunk of cheesecake and, and just skirt that thing down as you're leaving. Think about what God did today on Pentecost for you. And if you don't belong to Jesus Christ, fix it right now. There's no other time to fix it. You know inside here if you don't belong to Jesus, fix it. And if you need help fixing it, get with any one of these believers in here if you need help. If you don't need help, get on your knees, pray to God, ask for forgiveness, tell Him you believe in His Son Yeshua, that He died and rose, and you will be forgiven, washed as white as snow. You will receive the Holy Spirit, and then you get to go home and eat cheesecake as a blessed individual who belongs to the kingdom of God. That being said, I'll turn it over to you, Stephen. Amen.